So um, as uh, you all know, and, and we have today the pleasure to have Dr. Evelinda Latour as our guest speaker for, for the colloquium. And, and it's going to be quite a treat to have her uh, tell us about her work. And we just heard, for those of you that just joined us, and and Chin just joined us, and I know you know I'm from long ago. Uh, the the um, she's retiring, so again congratulations and a big loss for CSU, but but big news for you. And I hope you still are involved with all the your special issues in the state uh, that you have led for a long long time, and we really appreciate that. So I will briefly read a, a little bit of, of the background, which is extensive of Dr. Latouri. So, and actually I should probably share it so that you can try to follow as, as I read, but I'm just gonna read some of the selections from her background. I asked her to please <laughs> email me some of her information, but, but she has an extensive background and very distinguished uh, uh, background and work through the years. Um, She's a professor of geography in the Department of Ecosystem Science and Sustainability at Colorado State University. She's also the director of the Geospatial Center at CSU that uh, provides uh, support for geospatial research and teaching across the university. As a matter of fact, it is, is the, the heavy lifting of geospatial science and technology happens there and, and is on, on Melinda's shoulders and her team. Uh, she is a Fulbright Scholar having taught GIS at the University of Botswana um, in the Center for Scientific Research, Indigenous Knowledge and Innovation. She has also been a Rachel Carson Fellow of Environment and Society at the Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich and founding member of the Environmental Justice Group in the School of Global Environmental Sustainability at CSU. She has been a uh, uh, visiting scientist at the Center for Geographic Analysis at Harvard University and a former National Science Foundation program officer in geography and special, special sciences, where uh, I understand that she coincided with Anchin during some time. Then uh, she has been also a Jefferson Science Fellow, where she was the principal investigator on the Secondary City, Cities Initiative that we're going to hear more about today. And she's currently the principal investigator on the Department of State Cities COVID Mapping and Mitigation Program. Um, and regarding her formation, she got her PhD from the University of Arizona in Geography and held a three year tenure track position at the University of Oakland, New Zealand before joining Colorado State University in about nine, well, 1992, 1993, 95, right? Between the pyramid. Yeah, that's what I don't remember. Uh, so she teaches graduate level GIS courses at CSU, emphasizing the use of GIS in research applications. She integrates special literacy into her undergrad watershed science courses and at the CSU Mountain Campus field based course. All right, perfect. So with that, Melinda, welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. And uh, we are looking forward to hear about your work. Okay, thank you. That was um, way too long, <laughs> an introduction. Um, uh, Rafael, can you give me um, the ability to share, please? Yes, so I'm gonna try again. I should, you should have it, but let me, let me do it again. How about now? Yes, thank you. Right. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, excellent, thank you so much. And I'm, I'm so impressed to see so many people here on a, a Friday afternoon when it's such a beautiful day out. Um, but so uh, thank you very much for um, being here. Um, I'm going to talk about the Secondary Cities Initiative that was a five-year project in the Department of State's Office of the Geographer and the Humanitarian Information Unit it began in uh, 2015 when I was a Jefferson Science Fellow uh, at the unit there. And if any of you don't know about the Jefferson Science Program, Jefferson Science Fellowship Program, I would love to talk with you about it because I think it is a great opportunity and particularly right now with a 
a change in leadership in Washington, it should be an exciting time to think about that kind of a program. But uh, with that, let me talk to you about what this program was, was all about. Um, we were looking at uh, mapping urban areas and focusing on rapidly growing urban areas, uh, looking at places that are under-examined that face challenges with respect to accessing food, water, and energy, uh, figuring out how to how can people be provided with their um, basic services, and places that lack geospatial data for mapping and planning. So our emphasis was on secondary cities. And I'm always asked, um, what, what, it, what are secondary cities? What are you talking about? Well, secondary cities are, are those places that are not the mega cities, that are the rapidly growing cities that are, they could be um, provincial or state capitals. They could be centers of politics or centers of education, transportation, economics. Um, so they fill particular regional, um, regional voids and they're, um, again, places that are under examined and under mapped. And so we established a program through the Department of State's Office of the Geographer and in partnership with the American Association of Geographers, AAG, uh, who helped to also manage the budget side of this, this thing, uh, where we had 16 projects throughout the world um, that span the globe and really were looking at primarily um, developing countries, identifying those places, again, these cities that needed this, this approach with respect to geospatial data. And the emphasis was on emergency preparedness, human security and resiliency. And the other piece of this is I, I always struggled with the emergency prepared. I mean, I knew what, I know what emergency preparedness is, understand human security, I always struggled with resiliency. I'm not quite sure what that what that means, and maybe that's a something to have a conversation about as well. So we created three regional hubs based upon this these overarching um, this suite of projects that we had, and the way we chose these projects had to do with a, a number of uh, the complex partnership system that we were able to establish. Uh, so this is a secondary cities projects, which lasted anywhere from one to two years. And we really had a lot of help from the US embassy in terms of identifying on the ground, where were good partners to have? Where would be good, well, who are the cities that, that seem to be primed and be ready to host a project such as this? And so looking at things that had to do with uh, local universities, did they have connections with professors there? because we found that across all of these projects, universities were essentially islands of stability, much more so than national or regional or city governments, which would see a lot of turnover. It seemed that the universities, we had continuity with respect to developing part or establishing partnerships, as well as local NGOs were very strong in terms of being able to find partners there. So the embassy was critical in terms of us uh, helping to identify those uh, locations and then working closely not only with a local university but with city government. And so for each of these 16 areas, uh, 16 locations, I, I visited all of them and one of the first tasks was to talk to the uh, people at the national level who manage geospatial data. And my question to them was, do you have a national data policy and do you have an open data policy with respect to sharing such data? Because if, the, if they did not, then we could not do the project there because this was based on open tools, open technologies and open data. And all of them said, yeah, we do have an open data policy. And I was like, oh, that's very exciting. So where is the data? And oftentimes there wasn't really anywhere. You couldn't find this data. So a, a key aspect of this project was figuring out if we're going to start to create these kinds of data for under mapped areas, how are we going to ensure that the data was um, posted somewhere, that was shared somewhere, that was uh, useful, used in, you know, all those sorts of things that we talk about with respect to geospatial data. So in terms of thinking about emergency preparedness and human security and resiliency, we really emphasize the collection of human geography data and identifying these common data layers across our different projects so that we would have some ability to have some comparability across the projects, 
but also understanding that um, there are fundamental data sets that all cities really kind of need to be able to be able to tell the story with respect to uh, needs for emergency preparedness, uh, needs with respect to city planning, uh, things like this. And so we uh, went to the Worldwide Human Geography Data Organization and, and they've put together sort of this framework to look at with respect to identifying these common data layers. And so this was a driver for identifying useful data um, that our partners would collect. Because we created relationships with universities, we worked with students. We worked with youth mapper organizations or, or chapters. We worked with, um, uh, with people in the NGOs to be able to uh, do this data collection. And again, using uh, open source tools, so handheld devices, uh, where we would use, um, you know, ODK things or uh, Kobo Collect, uh, you know, some of these different sorts of tools. And we have a whole, whole list of these tools that we used and um, consolidating this into some sort of a standard across all of our projects. And so having sound metadata standards and data protocols that we put into place and we did trainings at all of our different um, project sites. And I'll talk more about those in a moment. And then really trying to build the basis for networks for the future. And I'll talk about this issue with respect to sustainability planning. You know, once we do these projects, you know, what happens to them? And one of the key things we learned that I think is really, really important is that we found that a little bit of money goes a long way in these places. And, and maybe that's not anything that, you know, um, illuminating, but, you know, any either any of these projects were anywhere from about $150,000 to $200,000 over the course of two years. That's not a lot of money. And it goes, it went really a long way with respect to some of the pro outcomes that we saw here. So this is our um, website um, that you can go visit and see a description of each of our projects. I think it's working. <laughs> and we also then posted all of our data on a secondary cities geonode. We use the GeoNode because again, this was an open platform and something that allowed us to post the data uh, easily. So we posted all our data here. We have over, I think over 1100 data sets that our, our teams collected from all of the different cities. And we also posted all of the, doc all of the documents here, um, the different documents that uh, were created from diff our, all of our projects. There was a lot of training materials that came out. There were reports that were um, created as well as map books that many of our partners created. And so they're all posted here on the secondary cities uh, geo node. Uh, so it's accessible and this is kept up to date, maintained by the state department so that we will ensure that we won't lose this data. So what are these projects? What, what is it that I'm talking about here? Well, um, the main focus of each of the project was determined by the partners themselves. We asked them to collect that standard set of data of human geography data, but each project then had a particular emphasis that, that was important for their area. And so you can see across all of these projects, uh, we put a little water drop to, next to some of them because so many of them were focused on some kind of water aspect, whether it had to do with water and sanitation or uh, access to water, or water quality, um, certainly water was a, a critical piece of all of these different um, projects, as well as other things that had to do with just measuring urban growth or looking at waste management and considering public health. So I wanna share with you quickly some of the um, outcomes from this project and how we facilitated that. For each of our different regional hubs, we held us a, a, secondary cities technical exchange. So we brought all of our partners together to talk about what they had done, what, how they collected their data, what lessons they learned, what were best practices, and trying to focus on this question of sustainability. How do we keep this going and how do we um, make sure that we can build and, and leverage on this activity? So in Latin America, we had six different projects um, across, uh, this was in Ecuador, Argentina, um, uh, Dominican Republic, Mexico, Peru, and Colombia. And yeah, oh, oh, I forgot I had this. Um, so here's an example of where all those projects are in our Latin America hub. 
And so just to share with you uh, something from each of these projects. In Tijuana, Mexico, uh, we were looking at mapping canal communities using drones. And so the important thing was understanding the vulnerability of populations that live next to these canals and the potential for um, flooding in these regions. So using drones, our teams went out and were trained in utilizing the drones and collecting data and identifying things that had to do with the canals, had to do with, with communities that are there, had to do with trash dumps, all of these things that uh, create problems for uh, water management, particularly in Tijuana. I don't know how many of you have been to Tijuana, but while I was there, we had a very significant storm and the streets flooded immediately. They flooded just like that. And it's because the system of drainage and sewerage and um, the different canals filled up with water very rapidly when also compounded by the problems with waste and waste management. So because there's so much trash that would aggregate in the different areas, it would fill up and create big problems with, with flooding. So this was one of the issues that we looked at here and started to collect this data set across the city of Tijuana. In uh, Santiago, Dominican Republic, we again were also looking at vulnerable populations and its relationship to flooding. And we also started to collect data about the flood zone and the landslide zone because many of these areas have issues with respect to landslide problems, very high density areas and starting to identify where these locations are and thinking about what might be some strategies for um, flood uh, for the floodplain management so that there will be ways to reduce the high density in these very uh, sensitive zones. In Esmeraldas, Ecuador, we were looking also at issues, not only, it wasn't just about um, looking at water issues there, it fed into a whole number of issues because in Esmeraldas, they were really looking at water quality issues. And so they uh, went through the different locations and at each locations where there was a water uh, pollution source, they took a photograph of that. They took a photograph of the community uh, around that particular um, point source pollution. And they uh, also collected a suite of data about that. And so they were able to get um, develop a, a map with respect to water pollution due to commercial, domestic, industrial, municipal sources. This uh, city, this town is going through a lot of change and pressure. It's very close to the border with Colombia. We know that Colombia is having a lot of uh, migration problems that are happening there. And so they're spilling over into Esmeraldas. This is compounding some of those problems with um, water quality in this area. Uh, similarly, in uh, Santa Fe, Argentina, uh, big problems with flooding here as well, and awareness of where the informal communities were located in these areas. And the strategy in Santa Fe was to say, well, if we could find where these sensitive, um, where these vulnerable uh, communities are, what might we start to think about moving them and where would we move them? So in working with the, um, with the city government, there were discussions about uh, where these vulnerable communities could move. And this was an incredibly contentious uh, conversation because people don't want to move from their homes despite the vulnerability. Uh, these were places they have lived for a long time. And when the discussion began about moving to different places, it became very uh, tense, um, but there have been some move forward, movement forward to be able to kind of talk about what might be strategies that can help people better live in these areas or can they be, continue to talk about moving into new regions? And then in uh, Medellin, we, we did some work in Medellin, and this was kind of a, uh, doesn't quite fit into our model for secondary cities, but we were doing work in Medellin and we did it, we're doing a change detection analysis, uh, looking at urban growth patterns there. And what we found was that there was this huge change that was going on, particularly in these, some of these marginal areas. And when I was talking with the city government about this change detection analysis, uh, we found that many of the places that had the most rapid growth were actually outside the administrative boundary of the cities. But they were areas that everyone recognized as saying these areas are causing problems because this is where we have informal settlements starting to be created. They're causing increasing erosion problems with the 
um, with the very um, uh, dynamic stream systems that they have in Medellin. And so there were concerns about, you know, what do they need to do to address this? And so starting to even identify these locations and then talking about the next steps for this was something that was um, started to come out of this particular project. And then the final example, um, you know, what Medellin showed us and, and all of our projects, we did have access to high resolution satellite imagery to do these change detection analysis and to kind of depend identify where these changes were happening and who was moving where and coupling this with some of the human geography data to get a better understanding of vulnerable populations and what sort of um, you know management strategies need to go in place with respect to thinking about emergency uh, preparedness. So this was looking at high resolution imagery that we were um, that were made available to us and Coupling this with the um, um, global human settlement layer data from the EU that has this great data set to be able to look at these different epochs and start to see how the city has grown and expanded over time. So this really was quite helpful in understanding that change, uh, change detection dynamic. So those were our, our um, projects in Latin America. Our secondary cities projects in Africa then we had five of them in uh, Cameroon, in Ethiopia, in Nigeria, and uh, Ghana, and um, Mozambique. So these are where all of our projects were here. And the projects in Africa were a little bit different than the ones in Latin America. Um, let most of our Latin America country, uh, projects had much more data available to them than our Africa partners did. Our Africa partners were really working on getting really some of this baseline data that we found to be so critical for doing emergency preparedness planning and looking at some of those base, uh, you know, common human geography data layers. So finding where all the emergency shelters are across Port Harcourt, where are the healthcare facilities, what, is the, what are the security uh, services, overlaying this with the demographics of the area and trying to understand access to services. In Pemba, uh, Mozambique, uh, what we looked at there was also similar where they were collecting those suite of similar data sets. And this ended up being very uh, timely because while we were doing our project is in Pemba, was when Mozambique got hit by those double uh, cyclones that hit the coast, you know, one right after the other, just whammed right into it. And so some of these data that were collected in concert with other data that had been collected um, by the region, were able to use both pre and post understanding of what happened and the trying to get resources uh, to Pemba to resolve some of the uh, problems with, with respect to those two disastrous events. In uh, Boke Kemsar, Guinea, this is a really interesting area because it really is looking at a, um, a corridor city here. It's these, these two cities, this was actually really a smaller village there, but it was a, this is a critical corridor because there's so much mining that goes on in this area. And this is a port facility down here. So all the mining that goes on around here heads down to this particular location and what was needed so desperately here was just these base, a base map of the entire area. Uh, we used OpenStreetMap and established a youth math first chapter there. This really focused, uh, our partner there focused very uh, heavily on providing means for young girls to do this work. So the youth mappers chapter was really made up largely of young girls who were out there collecting a lot of these data and looking at things like water points, um, mapping some of the buildings, getting the road network mapped, and really trying to create that first base map of this entire area. You could tell that there was huge impacts from the adjacent mining that was going on because all of the streams run red. They just run red with the kind of soil that's there, you know, all the iron in the soil and things like that. And so it was really evident that issues with water and access to water was really would be the next step for what we will do with this project. Oh, it's another piece I have there. 
Uh, in Douala, Cameroon, this is a coastal city. Uh, issues with flooding are huge in Cameroon. Not only uh, flooding due to you know rainfall and uh, landscape itself, but really considering uh, issues with sea level rise. And so we did just some really simple um, analysis on this, just to say if there were one meter rise in sea level, five, ten meter rise. Where and overlaid this with all of the schools, you know, what might we see here and how might we start to develop strategies to begin to be prepared for sea level rise and have strategies for saying, well, some of these schools need to be moved and where will they be moved to? As soon as we talk about schools needing to be moved, people need to be moved. So what does that mean for future development for Douala? And then finally, looking at McKelly, um, which is in the news right now. I mean, all of our partners here, we were was just in communication with them in October, and suddenly it's all gone quiet. You know, there's no communication with McKelly. It's in the Tigray region of um, Ethiopia. The government forces have surrounded the city, was our last understanding about that. We've been collecting data there about uh, access to water. So looking at the different types of water systems they have there, the shallow wells, the public taps, the deep wells, and then actual uh, water delivery systems, who manages this and how. Um, we were doing analysis of these to understand the yield from water for this, how ownership of these different wells work with respect to who accesses this water and having a longer term plan for McKelly that obviously is right now just kind of on hold and we really don't know the status of our partners there. Uh, knowing where the University of McKelly is situated, I'm assuming that that's probably a, a fairly hot spot with respect to the kinds of things that are happening in, in Ethiopia right now. In Asia, we had um, five projects as well in um, Indonesia, in Nepal, in Mongolia, in India, and in Ukraine. Um, and so we also had a technical exchange uh, there. So this really spans that vast geographic area of Asia, uh, Central Asia to South Asia. So in Mongolia, they were really interested in looking at waste management. So they were collecting again, all of our common data layers, but really focusing on waste management and wanting to figure out ways to um, how could they improve this situation and how could they come up with better strategies for waste collection and identify better locations for where this waste is being taken. This is obviously something very critical for Mongolia because in the winter time there is no place to put waste. It gets so cold, the ground is frozen, there's usually um, plenty of snow that inhibits you know, being able to have waste dumps. So this is something that's really challenging compounded by the fact that Mongolia is one of those countries that really is experiencing the cutting edge of, of climate change and the kinds of adaptations that need to take place there. Uh, in indoor India, we were looking at health services across the entire city. So all of these different data were collected by our, our student teams to identify clinics, dental clinics, um, uh, things that had to do with hospitals, pharmacies, veterinarians, as well as some of our, our common data layers here. And then Denpensar, Indonesia was a really nice counterpoint to our Mongolia project because they were looking at ocean waste management. And so all throughout Denpensar, they were identifying uh, places to throw trash, uh, illegal dump sites, uh, recycling centers, and then the main depots for collecting a lot of the, the waste. And what they developed then was a, an interactive map online and then a handheld app where they could go out and have the community participate and continue to build this database. And they've gone on and been able to get funding from USAID and other local funders to help with facilitating and building on this because there's a real commitment in Denpensar to try to figure out ways to manage this ocean waste problem, which is so significant. In Pokhara, uh, Nepal, we were looking at emergency preparedness. And so you can see just the, from when we started the project early on in January, and then and later on in June, 
This is how the map started to fill in. And what uh, the, the teams did in Pokhara is they were looking at, again, filling in the map, but also looking at emergency preparedness and working quite closely with our, their local government. And they created um, a really nice map book that is now used in all their schools because they didn't have this kind of atlas before of their um, city at all. And so, and many of our projects actually created map books as well. So just um, as I um, come towards the end of this description of this project, we've been doing some analysis on some of these data. And so really trying to understand access to services and vulnerable populations. So looking at the population distribution and service locations, coming up with some density figures for these and trying to understand who has access to services. How far do people live from these and how well are we able to understand and get some um, results from this that would be helpful for uh, decision makers and have this built on uh, appropriate data. And so we came up with a, a number of maps. We used a, um, this kind of a strange bounding box to look at the city of Pokhara. But having said that, there's all kinds of development that's going on out in these areas of Pokhara. And what our data is telling us or what our results is telling us is that these margins are where so much is needed with respect to these social, social services. And so this was, this was something we found out. We compared this also with uh, issues in McKelly and issues in Denpensar and found similar things going on in those locations as well, even though they're in very different locations. In uh, Kharkiv, what we found is that was really an interesting issue there is they had never before mapped uh, the number of urban springs that exist across the, the city of Kharkiv. And yet these urban springs are used by people all the time. They're used for, um, um, you know, they're, they're some of them are park-like, some of them are places where people go to actually collect water. Sometimes the city water service is shut off, so people will go to these locations. And so what they did is they created a database of all of the different uh, springs across the city. They also established a water quality testing uh, program. So they were looking at the quality of water at all of these different springs, the amount of flow from the different springs, and then we did an analysis to look at, um, you know, if the water were shut off, how well could these springs actually supply the population uh, with respect to water supply? So talking about promoting sustainability, I said this project was a five-year project and we established these different regional hubs. Well, we have this huge network now and State Department uh, Secondary Cities Project ended Many of these projects kind of got other funding, uh, continued to do things, but we got a chunk of change out of the um, foreign, foreign Assistance Service uh, Organization with the federal government. And they're very interested in looking at cities COVID mitigation uh, mapping uh, strategies. And so we developed the C2M2 program and the aim is to look at second order impacts of the global pandemic. So second order impacts, I'll talk about that in a moment but we're um, capitalizing on our three regional hubs and the network that we've established here to use them to say, okay, we've been collecting data here. What might this, how might this provide the basis for us being able to understand these second order impacts of the global pandemic? Now, I'm in a situation where I can't go visit all these different places like I did for secondary cities. So we're, we're stuck on, the, on Zoom um, we're presenting on Zoom on these kinds of virtual platforms to share things. And so we have these different projects now going on in our different projects, partnering with many of our, our partners, our partner in Nepal. Uh, we have work now in Dhaka and Ulaanbaatar. Uh, we're looking at Bukavo in the Democratic Republic of Congo and Nairobi and Pemba. And we're also looking at Quito, Santa Cruz in uh, the Galapagos, uh, Lima, Cusco, Oro Puerto in Brazil, and Santiago, Chile. 
And what we're doing with this project is we're, again, looking at vulnerable populations in urban areas and these informal settlements and trying to get a handle on what are the geospatial aspects of these long-term and cascading impacts uh, that have to do with the COVID pandemic. The lockdown has caused certain problems. We know this certainly from the United States, but in these other places, the impact has been profound. Our Latin America colleagues have told us that the middle class has essentially collapsed. And so what will happen with respect to really trying to um, have some good data-driven uh, ideas about what can come from this? So we've asked our teams to create a baseline assessment with respect to the topic that they're looking at. And they may be looking at adequate access to health services or impacts on the economic sector or changes in movement patterns where we can come up with some monitoring and evaluation mitigation strategies and really demonstrating how geospatial analysis can be used to help with you know, data-driven decision-making. And so that's what I have for you. Here's a bunch of the teams around the world who worked on all these projects and have just done amazing things. And I would just end by saying that so many, so much of this is built upon these young people learning these tools and technologies. It gives me great hope for the future because they are uh, excited, they're creative, they're innovative, and they're dedicated and they're gonna make things happen. So I, I think we're in a good situation despite the, the challenging problems we have. And with that, I'm happy to take some questions. All right, fantastic, fantastic. Thank you so much, Melinda. That was very, very interesting and very, very inspirational too. Um, so, do, Go ahead, go. Now we're open, as Melinda said, for questions or comments. Anyone, just turn on your mic and jump in. I guess I'll ask Rafael, may I? Yes, please. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you, Melinda, for that talk. That was really interesting and <clears throat> really impressive um, in terms of the scope um, and diversity of projects. And I'm actually, I must say, I'm, I'm, I'm astonished that, that so much has been done in such a short period of time. Um, but I guess my question is, given the diversity of projects, I'm just curious how, how, how you landed on the project in each of these sites. Maybe you could go a little bit more in depth about how you chose, chose one of these secondary cities. And what was the process through which, you know, given the multitude of issues and data needs, um, and GI, potential GIS applications. How did you kind of get to the actual project you wound up working on in each of these sites? Could you walk us through that process a little bit? Yeah, that's a really good question. So it was really going to each of these places. And once the embassy had made the connections with us, I mean, they, they were, they're the ones on the ground, those people who are the environmental science and technology officers. You know, they're, they're there anywhere from two to three years in a place. And if you get one that's well connected and well understanding their environment, they had really good recommendations for saying, you know, I, I met this guy at this institution, at this university, and he's a good guy to talk to. And so I would go on what would be called a scoping trip. And I would meet with um, people at the university, meet with people in the, at the NGOs, meet with people at city government to get a sense, are, is, this gonna, is this gonna work? Um, you know, are these people, you know, really able to do what we're asking them to do? And some, there would be some times when there would be a group of people I'd be meeting with and be going, and the embassy would help setting up a lot of these meetings. And some people, I could tell right away, this, this isn't going to work. This isn't a good partner versus, oh, th these people really got it. They know what they're talking about. They're, they're, you know, there. So there's a little bit of, um, subjectivity on, you know, did I click with these people or not? Uh, you know, that was part of it, but definitely that embassy connection was so critical. So, and a lot of those people who are the embassy people have still been consistent around the world, even through the last four years of this administration that have created some, some tensions in different places. But these people are the ones who are the face of the United States and are the ones who have made really critical connections with local people.
Very good. Thank you. A any other questions or comments, please? I have a, I have a follow up to 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 Gregory's question. Do you do you um, was it useful for you uh, in terms of choosing the sites and the partners? like the networks like the geo for all or the open source software networks were you able to to reach out to them and were they useful at all um yes i mean open street map definitely was something that's been used across many of our projects and many of our partners were um using that as their platform what we had to ask them to do was say you know granted open street map says that data is out there and it's available we wanted to create a set of data that is also posted on our geo node. So bringing that data into the geo node and posting it there was also a critical piece of this um, because we, we wanted to take all the data sets to the next stage to be able to share with our partners, what do you do with it? You know, we, we've taught you how to, how to collect it and now so what? Um, so being able to do some kind of analysis with it and demonstrating its utility was the next piece. And OpenStreetMap doesn't give us that analytical environment that say QGIS does or Arc Pro, something like that. And so that was one of the other critical pieces. We wanted to stay as technology and platform agnostic as possible. So we allowed the, our partners to choose whatever suite of tools they wanted to use. And this created a huge problem or a huge issue with interoperability mm -hmm. and having us think about, you know, how can we work across platforms? How do we use all these different tools that are coming from an Android versus an iPhone and, and uh, tablets and uh, PCs and Macs? And, uh, you know, it was really, really challenging, but. Um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, there's a lot of stuff that can happen that happen sometimes by the seat of your pants, um, sometimes unplanned, uh, but at the same time, it, it gets to that next step. And I would say that these students were incredibly uh, innovative in terms of some of the solutions they came up with, with some of the problems that we had. You 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 touching another question that I had, so, so I'm going to hold to the microphone for a second. Please forgive me, everyone. But but uh, what was the perception of, of the use of proprietary closed software and open source software with your partners? Uh, what was there? A, what was the perception and level of use of each? Yeah, that's a really good question too. You know, because uh, you know some people are really irritated with using Esri. And um, Esri was one of our, our key partners on this. They came through and they provided all of our partners with a very um, reasonable three-year package for using their, um, their software, their, you know, their software. Um, now I've been an Esri user since the late 80s. Um, so I know everything about all the irritating aspects of Esri. I mean, they irritate me, let alone my partners being irritated by them. Um, that being said, you know, there's a lot to be said about using proprietary uh, platforms because there's a lot of the bugs that have been worked out of it. Yes, you do have to pay for a license and that license is often too expensive for many of the sites in our project. Um, but at the same time, we were using a lot of open source tools where we ran into a log jam and we had to get a developer to help us with that. So if you need to go to the developer for help, Sometimes you can go to that open forum, but you've got to wait for somebody who's willing to take the time to look at it, or you got to find the dollars to pay that developer to fix the problem. So there's there's uh, there's multiple sides to this question. And even though it, it's not necessarily either or, um, but we have a lot of our projects like the, a lot of our projects used Esri for a period of time and then switched over to the open source tools because we knew in the long run, that's where they're gonna end up going anyways, because our license arrangement with Esri was for three years. And our, our big, my big question was always, well, what happens after three years? What, what are they gonna charge then? So um, that's how that kind of ended up there. It's been, it's been an issue. Oh, great, thank you. Okay, I, I let the microphone go, so I <laughs> get Brian, yes. 
Thanks. Hi, Melinda. Thanks. That's a great presentation. And, and I, I really appreciate, again, as Gregory said, the, the scope of the work, but also the opportunity, I think, as you've done to look at both inter and, and intra um, regional similarities and differences. Your, your point about the, the vulnerable populations really intrigued me. And I was wondering, did you come across any patterns in the vulnerable, vulnerable populations that were identified across these three different hubs? Um, in particular, were, were children and youth identified as vulnerable populations, you know, sort of ubiquitously, or were there sort of region-specific uh, criteria for, for those kinds of, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question. I think in the first instance, we were really focusing on these informal settlements or informal areas in urban, in these urban sites. So people who, if they were living in these informal settlements, th those were our definition to start with, with a vulnerable group. They didn't have adequate access to basic services. You know, there were inadequate roadway networks. There was no water, running water. There was limited, if any, sanitation those sorts of things that we looked at it from that kind of a, a very kind of utilitarian perspective. But I think what, what compounds things now is particularly when we think about McKelly as an example, we know there's many informal settlements there, but now this very dynamic situation of probably enhancing the vulnerable population because people are forced to flee, uh, people have lost their homes. So vulnerability is this dynamic concept depending on what's going on there in that point in time. And, you know, we were exposed to that across all of these projects that this was, um, this was always a bit of a moving target. Thank you. Yeah, and I think it, it so sort of speaks to your point about the challenge of defining resiliency because resiliency is so dynamic um, as well. So, you know, spatially, temporally, um, socially, you know, so it's, it's, it does help me appreciate a lot of that nuance. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Latouri, uh, thank you very much for your time. That was a very interesting presentation. Uh, I had a question a little bit off topic. Um, with your current work on COVID and your time spent in New Zealand, do you have any thoughts or ideas on uh, how our countries are handling uh, the pandemic in such, such different ways? Yeah, we're, we're, we're not doing very good, are we? I, I mean, it's really a sad, a sad state of affairs. Um, you know, New Zealand was a whole different experience. I mean, think about New Zealand, you know, it's, um, there's what, when I was there in the uh, early 90s, there were like, you know, three and a half million people lived in, in New Zealand. You know, it's like the size of, at that time, the size of, you know, it just, it was the size of like Denver or Colorado when I moved to Colorado. So, you know, you can do a lot more in a little place like that and be able to really resolve problems. We are so complex in the United States. And again, the, um, the lack of leadership at the highest levels to not figure out how to coordinate a resolution to this very dire problem is a huge indictment on on the United States, unfortunately. Um, I'm, I'm, any other comments or questions? I, I have a, other ones. <laughs> uh, okay, so you, you mentioned about the issue of uh, sustainability, the sustainable development and your work, you know, and, and your experiences. Uh, so part of a sustainable project, like you were saying, is not only come in, collect the data, do the analysis, present the results, but leave like, like an infrastructure, right? That, that allowed for, for the work to continue or, or, or to contribute to local development. So in, in that sense, what are your thoughts in terms of, of, of the um, special information science and technology infrastructure uh, as part of, of sustainable development projects? Yeah, that's such a great, question because, you know, um, you know, we've all heard people now say, you know, data is the oil of the 21st century, you know, if it's not water, then it's data, um, and how important, you know, data is for decision making and, you know, these phrases of data driven decision making and, you know, how does geospatial science and technology fit into that puzzle and what do people need to do about it. So what I see is the ubiquitousness 
of geospatial results are all around us now. Look at all these data dashboards that are being put up about COVID all around the world that are showing things about um, geography, society, and space. And that's front and center. And I think we have, we have as geospatial scientists, we have such an opportunity right now to really, um, you know, spread the, the word to understand not only how this can help with things, but also what are the caveats, pitfalls, and limitations of this so we don't find ourselves too dependent upon it. So I, I just see this as such an um, exciting time for our students to be going into this field and really starting to um, you know, teach those lessons that need to be learned with respect to um, understanding this, this geospatial beast that we, we work with. I, I just think it's really um, an amazing time that we have, it, but, it's, but I also would just, you know, it is fraught. It, it, it's, it has its limitations. And this is the thing, you know, like I work with this guy who does a lot of work with R, you know, and, and coming up with, you know, making solutions in R and we were talking about things and he was saying, well, I'm not really a geospatial guy at all. But I'm doing all these things, you know, coding all this stuff in R, and I'm not sure if I'm really treating the data the way it ought to be treated, because geospatial data is kind of special, and people need to understand it, right? So where do they learn that if they're just seeing the back end or the front end of things all the time? They're just seeing the data dashboard, you know, what's going on behind the scenes? Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Melinda. All right, I let, let go of the microphone again, sorry. <laughs> any, any other questions? Aaron, I, I, did you move your hand? Yeah, go ahead, please. Hey, Dr. Latore, uh, my name's Aaron. Uh, thanks for a great presentation. I think we all got a little clinic there on how to deliver a presentation and extremely uh, efficiently. It was a lot of information pretty quick, so thanks. But as a follow-up to Dr. Simon's um, initial inquiry to you and your response, You'd mentioned that certain partnerships didn't um, didn't necessarily pan out, and I was just curious on kind of what some of those reasons were, if they were politically based, or if you give us maybe some insight on on why some of those relationships didn't develop. And then secondly, I was curious to know what kind of um, federal re regulations in um, TJU you, um, you experienced with regard to um, uh, drone acquisition. Oh yeah. The, well, I'll start with the drone thing first. That was that was kind of a big deal. I actually didn't realize that they were going to go and buy a drone and do that work in Tijuana. And when the teams went out and were using their drone, they actually got held up by gunpoint and they got their drone stolen from them um, because people were wondering what the hell they were doing out there flying this drone around. Um, so that really caused um, quite a, a problem. They actually ended up getting their drone back which is kind of exciting to, to know. Um, but something we, we worked on with all of our projects, which just didn't happen, this one was, you know, if you're gonna go into communities, you've gotta go in and meet with them first, let them know what you're doing, have some kind of credential that either you're all wearing the same vest with some kind of a, a letter of support and you've already met with the community leaders so that people know what you're doing. And something got overlooked in that. So that was a, a huge, um, it was well, a, a important lesson learned. Um, with respect to places that where things worked and things didn't work, a lot of um, over time, what happened is when we were working with the local governments, there was huge turnover in the local government. Um, and there was huge instability in the local government. And there was always some election going on somewhere where the leadership was changing. We had to go back in and kind of reconnect with maybe the new mayor or the new leadership that were voted in to say who we were and what we were doing. And um, the fact that this was a, you know, something that was supported by, you know, all these different organizations in their city, this sort of thing. So that was, that was one suite of issues. Um, oftentimes when we started to train up people and we're working with NGOs, um, they would get snapped up. The people who got trained up would get snapped up by other um, jobs to be able to get a, a better position. And, and maybe that's a success story, but at the same time, that's that brain drain that happens in these, these places. Um, 
And then finally, just the, the lack of support that many of the universities just don't have. They may have had uh, computer science labs. They may have even had ESRI licenses or cracked versions of, of ESRI software. Um, but, you know, there was really a lot of limitations to the facilities themselves. I mean, one of the things that I did in all the places I went, the key thing that to me, what the metric for me was, I wanted to see, I wanted to see the women's bathrooms. That told me a lot on whether or not what was going on in this place. Because if you have women's bathrooms that aren't functioning and that are not safe to go to, where my colleagues wouldn't even let me go to them, then there's a problem. And so that's even more fundamental than you know the Secondary Cities Project. This gets into the whole gender and a lot of different issues. I've written a lot of bunch of stuff on gender issues in, in these countries with respect to access to just the fundamentals for sanitation and things like that. So, so that's another factor in all of this that is one of those heartbreaking things, but it is changing. And the fact that, you know, I think I could step away from this project and say, you know, it was pretty successful. It wasn't a hundred percent successful, but it was pretty successful, I think. Thank you. I, I thought you were going to say that there were no drone regulations in, in Tijuana, but so that's uh, it's a little surprising, but yeah. And so when I went to Tijuana, you know, I don't know if it's changed, but the time when I was there, you know, I had to have all these security briefings and everything because it was the number one ca murder capital of the world. And so they were telling me that, you know, you got to be careful when you're walking around and where you're going because, you know, you could get swept up in something. It was the same thing in Nigeria when I was there. They were saying, well, you know, usually what happens if they see a, a foreigner around, then, then they want to kidnap you. And you could get kidnapped on Friday night, but they want to get rid of you by Monday. So we'll try and get the money to them by Monday if that should happen to you. But this was not something I wanted to hear about. I didn't know about that before I left. I didn't tell my husband about that when I came back. He, was, he wouldn't have liked to have known that. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> All right, so we have uh, a little bit of time for a couple of more questions. Anyone comments? Dr. Latouri, thank you for, for a great, great presentation. Interesting discussion, very wide ranging. Um, what, on the topic of water resources and sanitation, uh, did well and resilience, I guess I'm thinking of, <laughs> sorry about the dog. Um, are you thinking about nature-based solutions in any of these place, places? Also contextual engineering. I am, there's a scholar at University of Illinois who writes about contextual engineering and how important it is to do the legwork before um, you know, engineering solutions are brought in and that kind of thing. I thought that was very interesting. I can't, Ann Perry Whitmer is her name, but um, also, whether Water for People, the organization that deals with basic sanitation, would some of the work they do be applicable in some of those settings? And I guess anything you want to say further about the water management issues and maybe if nature-based solutions are- Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, just, just thinking about water and water issues, I mean, that's one of my key uh, research areas over the years have been looking at doing watershed analyses and watershed science management, these kinds of issues. So water was, was um, like I say, almost ubiquitous across all of these projects. And thinking about the ways that we need to address these issues with respect to access to water, it, it hasn't gone away. And if anything, I think COVID is compounding some of the, the issues that people are just starting to have some resolution to. So uh, I'm, I'm very, um, on the one hand, I'm, I'm very excited to work on the COVID project right now and see how we can use some of the lessons we learned from secondary cities to help with driving some of the data collection efforts that we're gonna need to ensure that uh, these, popu these vulnerable populations will have access to these basic services and you know, water being particularly um, one of them.
Thank you for that. Excellent. Any any other questions or comments at this point? No, if not, uh, uh, you saw that Melinda left us with her her email, and 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 she. I, I'm hoping that she will make available her slides also, and we oh, will sure. post them as in this usual place. Um, so if, if there are no other questions, let's go, let's go. All right. So, all right, well, I really appreciate your presence here and Melinda, your time to be with us is really appreciated. Uh, big, big congratulations to you for your retirement. Uh, very sorry for CSU to see you go. Uh, and, and I hope you keep involved in the leadership with, with the, your special science and technology people in the state like you've been doing for so many years. That is highly appreciated, your leadership with the, with the education group. Uh, and thank you for that. And and also, I mean, uh, I was just remembering that Dan Carver, one of our graduates now, recently joined your team over there. And, and that's very exciting for him. And and, I, and it's too bad you're leaving now. <laughs> he was looking forward to grow more together with you. So, but, but hopefully you will be engaged uh, uh, with the university in some way, shape or form. Thank you. Thank you so much for asking me. I'm, I'm figuring this is like my my last kind of formal talk as a professor at CSU. So this is really a big moment. I'm going to go have a drink. I'm really excited. Yes. Yeah. We will toast <laughs> your health. And okay. Yes, we will. And, and we have the recording. So now it's for okay. it's for history. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Melinda. Thank All you right, everyone bye -bye. for being here. Thank you. Have a wonderful break and, and hey, be in touch. You too. Bye, everyone. Bye.